Hello? Big George. Who's that? Hey, it's Dave Lawrence, Hawaii Public Radio. All right, man. Everything is good, man. How are you? <laughs> Doing real good. I don't know how long my phone going to hold out, but let's do something. <laughs> well, that's a, I appreciate your time very much, and, and thank you for uh, for grabbing the call. Sure. You got a. Uh, you're coming back to town, and in the most recent record, my inspiration, a tribute to Nat King Cole. I know it means a whole lot to you. Recorded with a big orchestra, also some special guests on there, some duets. Talk a little bit about what it means to you, and maybe some of your favorite memories of doing it. Well, first of all, the the best records on the radio when I came up were Nat Cole records. They had so much class to them, you know, and uh, they always had great uh, melody great arrangers, and uh, the musicianship was incredible. So I said, man, when I grow up, I want to be like that. <laughs> and, you know, it never went away. He was always great. Every time every time he put out something new, it was as good or better than the last thing he did. So, so he became my, my, my favorite artist. And when it comes to doing this compilation, I mean, 42-piece orchestra, who decides that the Henry Mancini Institute Orchestra will participate? And is there anything unique about having to work with them to create the music? Well, I'll tell you, it was my uh, conductor. Uh, his name is Randy Waldman, and Randy Waldman was in my band when he was 22 years old. He's, out, he's from Chicago, and he stayed with me about six years. Then he disappeared. I didn't hear his name or nothing. I heard a piece of music on the radio one day, and I said, man, why do I recognize that? And it was a number one record by a group called uh, uh, Casey and JoJo, two brothers. And it was a number one record, and I said, who produced that record? And it was Randy Waldman. Mm. Now, this was over 20 years later. Then I said, Randy, what have you been doing? He said, I've been working with Barbara. I said, Barbara, who? He said, Barbara Streisand for the last 20 years. <laughs> so he always knew I loved Nat. And when I got the project, uh, the, the go ahead to do that album, I called Randy because I knew he, he could handle it. And uh, he and uh, um, John Burke from uh, our record company, Concord, uh, settled on the group, um, uh, the, the orchestra from uh, Miami, called the Mancini uh, Youth Symphony Orchestra. Nice. And, man, what a ball to work with these kids. They did 14 songs in one session. Oh, actually, it was a double session, but in one day. So we were very happy. It saved us a fortune, but they played the music excellent. And they were all kids, too, huh, George? They were kids, you know, uh, young, very young people. Like in high school kids? I would say that, yeah. Okay. Like, that's Senior hip. high schoolers. What a neat way to pay tribute to somebody. I mean, that brings everything full circle. You talk about being there, listening to that on the radio when you're a kid. You know, you're a kid yourself, and there you are. You're helping to, in a lot of ways, you're, you're continuing his legacy by doing this, and you're utilizing young, talented people in, in the collaborative effort. Man, yeah, it was incredible to work with kids and to inspire them because they were so knocked out. Knocked out. On being uh, with, on a session with me, right? And during Nat Cole's songs, I mean, they actually couldn't believe it. And everything was coming out so well; they knew that they were in a historic project. I think one day they're going to be very, very proud of what they did on the session. And that's a man. He's talking about a lot of things there about just inspiring people's lives to to have a positive impact on their life, to try to do stuff, to give them that inspiration of working with you at a young age. In a lot of ways, it's a give back to the community by doing that. It, it turned out to be so. You know, I didn't go at it for that reason. Right. But it, I've learned a long time ago that young people, you never know who the star is among them. But mixed in with all those young people struggling, trying to get trying to make a dent in the music and there's always a superstar lurking in the background who does not know he's a superstar yet <laughs> no totally but uh you know i know what it means to be inspired because that's what happened to me in my early days some of the local people in my hometown inspired me they taught me theory harmony and theory and uh once i grasped the meaning of what they were saying my career skyrocketed I said, wow, you mean I can put this from over here onto that? How come nobody else has done that before? 
And they said, George, they probably have, but they haven't done it in the way that you're doing it. <laughs> and they were correct. <laughs> well, part of that, dude, which I think is huge, brings us to uh, not not necessarily to your tour that's bringing you to Hawaii, but it does bring us to Hawaii in another way. If I and, and forgive me if the information I've acquired is wrong. Sometimes that happens in research. But what I understand is that the ukulele was your very first instrument. That's right. <laughs> it was. My stepfather found it in a garbage can. I was seven years old. And I wanted to play guitar, but my hands were too small. <laughs> so he found this ukulele in a garbage can, and somebody had broken it up, smashed it. He glued it back together, and he put some strings on it, and he taught me the first two or three chords. And I found out, I, oh, I could do a lot with those two or three chords. There were a lot of songs I could play. Right. So I took it to the street corners, and somebody saw me out there with my uke, and, and they went in their pocket and paid me money to play a song, and I could not believe it. <laughs> Your first, oh, yes, the ukulele was my, my first instrument. And and your first paying gig. <laughs> Excuse me? Your first paying gig, too. That's true. That That's what turned me into a professional at seven years old. If the word professional means you to be paid for what you do, I started when I was seven years old with the ukulele in my hand. You still play one? Do you own one? I own several. When I was in the islands, I did a small collection of them. They had some great players in the islands. As a matter of fact, Hawaii, let's face it, they're the best ukulele players on the planet. <laughs> right on. And uh, I heard some great music because I used to spend my afternoons on Maui listening at records by all of the top Hawaiian stars. My very favorite was Gabby Pakinui. Right. <laughs> Believe it or not. He was so real and so Hawaiian, you know. And and then I heard all of the rest of them, you know, all the great ones in the islands, like Danny Kalei Kini and uh, Lowell Garner and the brothers Casimero and, uh, of course, Uncle Willie K. They called him Uncle now. When I met him, he was a teenager. <laughs> <laughs> man, I have great experience in the island, man. That stuff affected me in, in, a, in an incredible way. It taught me, you know, like country music has its own beauty within it. It is a whole art form within itself and a whole culture. That's the way Hawaii is. Mm -hmm. Once you get into that culture, you love every moment and you savor every moment. So when I was in my home on Maui and looking out at uh, uh, Molokai on, one, on my left and, uh, no, Molokai on my right and Lanai on my left <laughs> and all of the hotels along the beach, you know, uh, the Hyatt, the Marriott, the Westin, which used to be the Maui surf, man, what great memories I have of all of that. So when I'm there, when I come there to play music, I am going to be, it's like coming home for me. <laughs> and you, what did you sell your house? You don't, you don't have that anymore? I did. Um, my kids got grown and they wanted to go where they had more uh, opportunity, you know, and had more highways. They, the Noah P. Ilani Highway, which is outside of my house, is only, the only one highway going to either Kakalui or uh, to the airport, you know, or Wailea. But, um, were you living I here full-time? Were you here full-time when you were here? Oh, yeah. Uh, the first four, year, four years were full-time. After that, I I shared it with my house I had in uh, Tenafly, New Jersey. So I was back on the East Coast, back and forth. But we love that house. We never imagined that one day we would not have it. And it feels strange not to have it, to tell you the truth. Wow. I mean, when I hear you talk, I hear the, I didn't, I hadn't, uh, that's huge that you got the connection that you do to, uh, to the state in general. I'm sure that's, uh, and all these artists that, that makes more sense, I guess, why you're so familiar with the music because you were here all the time. <laughs> so what would you do? What, what era, what, what years approximately in your life was this that you were living here full time? Well, I, I, I moved there in, in 79. One of my sons was born. He is um, Christopher Kiki Kiki Copa <laughs> Benson, Julian Benson. <laughs> he was born there at uh, Maui Medical. Is that what they call it? Maui Medical Hospital? Maui Memorial? Maui Memorial. That's right. He was born there. <laughs> so one of my boys is Hawaiian. So with that, I can do anything I want now because I got some blood in the house. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> <laughs> what a ball that is, man, to have that kind of connection. Oh, it is. And, of course, uh, Henry Kali, um Capona? Yeah, uh, Henry Allen. Oh, okay. Kalei Aloha Allen. 
Oh, your other son. Okay, I'm sorry. Mm-hmm. And say his so name again. Say that name. Was a, say his name again. Henry? Say his full name again. Henry Kelly Aloha Allen. Wow. We all call him Henry Allen, but he likes to use that Hawaiian name, and I agree with him. And that's two he of them. Loves his, his, he's now um, uh, part of the Hawaiian music culture thing. He's uh, They put him in charge of the Hawaiian music, you know, so it can last. He's trying to keep the music uh, alive. And he lives here? Yeah, he lives in on Maui. Wow, so you really still have a strong connection. So you have one son on Maui, and you come back just to visit him, I'm assuming, on a more informal basis. No, actually, he was born on Maui. He's with me. He left with us. But the fact that he was born on Maui, uh, and it's all recorded history, Right. I can always refer to that. Anything I want to do in the islands that, that goes beyond just tourism, I can refer to that. And it really gives a strong evidence that I was deeply entrenched in the island and it and you know and, and all the things that go on in Hawaii and it's one of the best parts of my life and I hope maybe one day I'll get an opportunity to move back I think it's just a it's great I'm sure people listening are more even more inspired to go and see you when they know that you got that strong uh, connection and you mentioned a few names locally and before I let you go it, w- it would be wrong if I didn't just get a story out of you on some of these monsters and they literally are monsters that populate your legacy um, and I know it was a long time ago but forgive me I really wouldn't mind George if you could tell me a little bit about up close and personal with the great Miles Davis. Well, when you look at Miles from afar, he, he seems very different and very uh, strange to those who don't know him. And he was every bit of that. He was very different and very strange. <laughs> but, you know, there was something about him that I liked. I appreciated, I appreciated his honesty. He was a little crude at times, but he was always honest. He would tell you his thoughts, his honest thoughts. He didn't hold anything back. And, uh, but every time he spoke, I learned something. I recorded with him way back in 1967. And while I was in the studio, I got a chance to know uh, several things. But I was one of his biggest fans, and he was one of my biggest fans. So I didn't know he liked me so much, you know, until way later in, uh, you know, in our careers. Then we started doing gigs together in the late 80s and early 90s. And so, uh, uh, he was much more than people imagined. They, they thought of him as something strange or baroque, or if I may use that term. But he was truly a genius, not only musically. His philosophical views were uh, bordered on genius, too. That's amazing. You spent personal time with him, too, I'm assuming, with all that extra tour time that came later in your career. It was amazing how he always, he's the one who hit on me and said, George, we'll be on an airplane. George, come on over here and sit by me. And he would have his shoes off. I said, Miles, until you cover up them toes, I ain't coming over. Because <laughs> he had some monstrous looking toes. I love and you. He would put his shoe on. We laughed. Everybody laughed. I love I you. Too. Sat with him and he would always ask me, What do you think about when you're playing? I always thought he was kidding me, you know? Then he said, No, man, I'm not kidding you. I want to know what it is, what goes through your mind when you start. Uh, doing your improvisations, and I had to explain it to him the best I could. But I didn't. I couldn't put what I felt into words. You know, I just did what I believed in. But he let me know that he really appreciated what I was doing. Dude, you must hold. I mean, that's the kind of thing. Uh, yeah, that's a lot to think about all these years later. Now that he has uh, passed on, and God knows you've had a lot of connections with other folks too. But that's a. It's like he's still here, man. I feel it. I feel it, brother. I have no doubt. I mean, my, my, my mom passed in 2013, 2013. I know she's still right here listening to our conversation. So I have absolutely mm-hmm. no doubt whatsoever about what you just said. Um, another guy, and then I'll, I'll let you go. Stevie Wonder, Songs in the Key of Life. Maybe you've done some other things along the way, too. He's just such a huge guy, and his, his disability makes what he does to me so inspiring. He's a humbling figure. Anything you can throw out there, I'd be really grateful for. Oh, and I can tell you this, what you probably already know, and we only get one Stevie Wonder in a lifetime, and he lives up to everything that he, uh, that you see and hear, is solid as a rock. 
Not only is he one of the great composers of our time, he's a great arranger, a great musician, one of the best singers of our time, one of the great, greatest artists of our time. So I hope, oh, oh, that the uh, special that he did the other day, I'm glad he got a chance to do it then. Because the world deserves to see Stephen Wonder in his own habitat, doing what he loves and what he believed in. I wish I could have been there. He did invite me to be on the, on his tour, actually, Songs in the of Life. But I have my own tours I'm doing. So I, I, but I'm proud to have been on that album. Uh, he called me in the middle of the night and said, George, get over here. I need you. I said, Stevie, it's nighttime. <laughs> you know? But, uh, yeah, he's he's uh, just an incredible person. And uh, and I look for some more music. I don't think people have seen the last of what he He's going to present to us in this in these few years that we all have left. Yeah, God bless him, and that's a that's a wonderful thought. I got to see him at Madison Square Garden one time, and I'll tell you, brother, I hold that up there high. Um, you know, I, yeah. I mean, what can you say about Stevie? And that's just uh, you only. Fact, hmm? I was there probably at that concert. I did. That was uh, the 2009 one. I was talking about Rock Hall of Fame. Oh, that's a new one. Okay, no, I, I I was in an earlier one than that, but but I do know that environment, and he tore the place up. You jammed with him at Madison Square Garden previously. You're saying? Uh, no, I went to to see his show. Okay. Oh, and saw him live in the in the house. Yeah, yeah knockout. Because there's a lot of people on the show that I knew, and don't forget, I recorded with with the group uh, um, Wonder Love. My brother, let me tell you something. If I, if it wasn't out of respect for the other people who you got to yak to, I'd be hitting you up hard about Rod Stewart, B.B. King, Quincy Jones, Lou Rawls, The Muppets, Frank Sinatra, Aretha Franklin. I mean, come on now. Don't even don't even pull my leg like that. I'd be here all day with you. You'd be like, all right, it's time for me to go. You know, so I, love them all. I know you Believe do. That. When you come to town, do you think it'd be all possible to do a quick follow up, or is that a hassle? Just tell me if it's a hassle. Man, sure we can do it, man. Why not, man? Aloha, this is George Benson, and you're listening to All Things Considered with my friend Dave Lawrence. With my friend Dave Lawrence. Good man. I give you a hug, a high five. I'll reach out to Yvonne. And let me tell you, brother, that was a great bunch of stories. You're a wonderful storyteller, and I hope someday you tap that side of you even harder and use it. Get on the radio, get on the TV. Your stories are magical. One thing I forgot to mention, we do have a book out, and it is amazing. Everybody loves it. It's doing very well. It's my life. It's called George Benson, My Autobiography. Check it out, okay? I will, brother. You have fun talking today? Man, it was a ball. Thank you. God bless you, brother. I'll talk to you soon. Take care. All right. Bye.